Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Perfect. I will go to presentation mode and then let's start. So if I can already say I forgot our mentors on here and I want to thank like Jesper Dram, Gloria Pino and Matt Chantry who are really a great help. And let's jump right in. So I think probably all of you have played with one of these online AI image generators. They all kind of work in the same way. You put in some kind of conditioning information, which usually, usually is a text description, might also be an image. This gets then fit into a machine learning model, a special kind of machine learning model called a diffusion model. And this then produces various images. For example, you could ask for an image to illustrate a presentation, and then you get some nice results. And what we want to do is basically apply this kind of methodology to predict the weather. In our case, of course, the conditioning information would not be a text, it would be a weather state. Then we feed this into diffusion model and we want to get out multiple weather forecasts. Okay, before I describe in more detail how we do this, I think it's worth like to spend some time at least on how diffusion models work. So if we have an image in our training set, what we do then is usually we add various or increasing amounts of Gaussian random noise. And because this addition of the Gaussian random noise is somewhat similar to diffusion, um, this whole class of machine learning models is called diffusion models. And what we are interested in in the end is, of course, not to go from a cute looking cat to random noise, but we want to go from the random noise and step by step build up some good looking image. So the question is, like, how do we reverse this? How do we go from noise back to the image? And this works as follows. Um, for each of the images in the training set, we just first choose randomly one of these noisy versions of the image. And um, we then give our neural network the information that uh, gives it some conditioning information. In this case, we would tell it, for example, the original image that we put in was a cat. And then we ask the neural network to, given this noisy image and the class label, to split up the noisy image into a part that the network thinks is the true image and into pure noise. And then, of course, we can compare the network prediction with the true image and compute a loss function and adapt our neural network parameters to make the predictions better. And of course, we don't only want to do this for a single image. We want to do it for every single image in the, in the training set that we have. For example, we might have another image of a cat, choose a different noisy version here. We might also have other classes, for example, an elephant or a dog. And after the training is finished, we can then use the neural network that we've trained to build up the entire images. So what we then feed in would be like a randomly generated noise vector. And we would put in like the kind of class that we want to have in the end. For example, we would say ahead we have a class and then step by step, our neural network would make the noise less noisy and more cat-like. Now the thing is, I think most people at Code4F are not primarily interested in images of cats, but in weather. So the question is, how do we adapt this to weather now? The first thing that we change is that we use different conditioning information. So instead of providing a class label, what we provide is something that actually helps us make weather predictions. And this is, of course, how the weather is like at the moment. So we feed in the current weather and we feed in maybe also what the weather was like, like a short time ago. And then we sample a random noise vector. And then hopefully if our training works well, we can use this and predict a future forecast. Okay, so what's the data that we train this on? It's called the WeatherBench data set. And um, it was created as a benchmark challenge to benchmark different kinds of machine learning models for weather forecasting. And, and the task is basically to predict whether three days or five days, days ahead. WeatherBench is just a subsampled version of error five. Um, subsample, I mean, downscaled, no, not downscaled, uh, interpolated causal resolution. And the resolution, resolution, the causes resolution in the data set is available is 5.6 degrees, which then corresponds to 64 pixels in the uh, longitudes and uh, 32 in the latitudes. And we have a time step for every hour. And the temporal extent is as follows. We use the years 1979 to 2015 to train our method. We validate our method and the data from 2016, and we test on 2017 and 2018 data. And there are a lot of different variables available, including, for example, geopotential height, temperature, relative humidity, and all different kinds of wind speeds. And most of these fields are even 3D, meaning that we have multiple pressure levels or multiple heights, kind of. And of course, we cannot use all of this data because it's just huge. 
um, therefore we need to um, select a subset. And in all of the results that I will show later, uh, we only use Q potential height and we use a sub-selection of the pressure levels that are available. Yeah, and as I already said, um, due to the large size, we also had some problems in the beginning, but we think mostly solved this right now. Okay, so I think I still owe you to tell I still owe you to tell you what actually is compared on weather bench in the weather bench data set. So the metrics that are computed there is mainly the root mean squared error. There's more, but let's focus on the root mean squared error, and it's evaluated for two variables, which is the geopotential potential height at 500 hectopascal and the temperature at 850 hectopascal. Okay, so how do our results look like? <clears throat> Before we see how our results look like, let's have, first have a look at like, what a true result would look like. So this is what we are aiming for, just a random selected time step of the geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. And our prediction looks like this in this case. So we can see the overall shape of the diffusion model that the diffusion model produces is very good. So I think if we don't have any labels here, we couldn't really tell them apart but we can see some differences. For example, in the Southern Pacific here, we can see that the structure is not exactly identical. And you can see this difference also if we subtract the two from each other. So we can see here that the difference is lowest in the tropics and the differences increase if you go to a higher latitudes. And just to show you that I didn't just cheat by picking one good time step, we have a second time step here. And we can see that, first of all, the patterns are different. So the network doesn't predict the same thing for every time step, which is already a good thing. And then um, we can see that, again, we sort of met match the structure of the target well, but there are, again, some differences. And we see similar patterns in the differences. OK, one nice thing about diffusion models is that we can produce ensembles. So in the example that I used to illustrate the approach, I put in one sentence and I got back four images. Right now we can do the same thing. We could, can put in one weather state and we can get out a whole bunch of ensemble members. And then ideally we can do some analysis on this. Um, we haven't really done this in detail. Just for illustration purposes, I just show like the standard deviation of the ensemble here. So we can see that the standard deviation is highest in the regions where also the network is not really sure what are the deviations between the predictions and the ground truth are largest. As WeatherBench is a benchmark data set, there are luckily also already a few methods that we can compare to. And this is what I will want to show in this plot. So what this plot here is the performance as a function of the lead time. And the lead time is also the time, the amount of time we want to predict into, into the future is given here in times of days. And what we plot on the y-axis is the root mean squared error of the geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. And yeah, just to say smaller is better in this case. And the first thing I want to show in this plot is the operational ECMWF model, which is, of course, the thing that everybody tries to beat with these numerical weather, uh, deep learning weather prediction models. And so the top model that has an entry in the uh, weather bench data set is the following. It's by Rasmus and Shiri. And also, I want to give one more model. This was uh, the paper that introduced the um, weather range data set had also some met methods inside of it and this was the best performing method was this cross and this cross and now the question is where are we on this curve and we are here so that means that um our performance is still worse than uh, quite a, uh, quite a margin worse than the best model on weather range but we already match the best uh, best yeah the best version that was introduced with the original original paper and we can all, of course, see that the farther we predict in the future, the harder the task gets. So there's still quite some room for improvements. Okay, then let me finish by telling you what next steps we are planning to do. Of course, uh, if we try to beat a benchmark challenge, we want to get better results. And a bunch of papers, for example, GraphCast, ProCastNet, and Pango Weather have found that if you go to even higher resolutions and throw a lot of computational effort at the problem, tend to get better results. So what we want to go is to like final resolutions for the yeah for the first step, uh, which is of course memory demanding and which might um, make us use latent diffusion, which is like a special kind of a diffusion model um, that was very successful. Also many of these online image generators are based on latent diffusion. Um, we might look into different models we can use as a backbone for diffusion models and we can 
right now we have a very small subset of input variables um, and we would like to expand this at some point in the future. The second thing we want to look into is um, how we evaluate the model. And because we have this nice ensemble prediction aspect, I think one thing that's definitely worth looking into is how to evaluate these ensembles nicely and also maybe focus on large impacts and yeah, extreme events. And the third and last point is um, that we want to go from predicting single time steps to predicting trajectories. So the way we do it now is we train a single model to go from the initial time step like three days ahead, for example. And ideally, we would want like one continuous trajectory of the weather like for one, two, three, four, and so on hours. And there are basically two approaches we have in mind for this. Um, there are special diffusion models that can be used for predicting videos. And the other thing one could do is uh, train a model and then apply it iteratively. So feeding its output back into its input. Yeah, um, this was everything for me. Um, if you have questions, I hope you have questions and um, then I would be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, nice presentation. And indeed, uh, we have questions. So we have two questions. And I would go immediately to the questions of Philippe. Daniele is asking how uh, you decided the tra training and validation test set division. Yeah, uh, so we did this to be compatible with already existing approaches. So we just uh, copied the methodology of somebody else. There's reasons why we would want to split it this way. For example, it makes sense to keep continuous splits in time so don't you do that you don't shuffle it. Like, let me open it. So you don't want to shuffle the, the time test uh, split and validation set because otherwise the neural network could use information from the training set to infer on the on the test set. Yeah, I think this is the main point. And the second question I think is um, about the number of diffusion steps. And this is in fact a hyperparameter. And um, yeah, we keep it fixed to 1000 at the moment, which is I think a standard choice. And then Nicole, Nicolas uh, Masterantonas has also a question. Um, very interesting, Jonathan. Thanks. It seems that the model has challenges in the middle attitude. Would it make sense if you train regional models, models with finer resolution for those regions rather than for the whole globe and somehow combine the results somehow? <laughs> yeah, that's also something that I thought about. If, I think in the end, it's probably easier to do it globally because if you do it regionally, you need some way to combine the information from like adjacent patches. So for example, if there's like a storm system coming into your regional model, you need to somehow give this information to the regional model. And um, yeah, so this is, you don't have this problem in a global model. And right now we're not really limited by the memory. Once we reach the point, we might also go there. There are also like, there are some papers that use vision transformers that actually split up the images in different patches. So yeah, there are some people who explored this already a bit. Okay, good. Thanks a lot, Jonathan.